Okay, getting into vascular emergencies, we've got to remember that not all chest pain is necessarily cardiac in nature. We're going to talk about uh, aneurysms, we're going to talk about PEs again, aortic dissections, vascular occlusions or blood clots, and then the big one which is the deep vein thrombosis, also known as a DVT, which is a big blood clot um, that is famous for creating other blood clots in the body once developed, uh, usually found down in the lower extremity. Okay, so peripheral vascular disease is due to a buildup of the atherosclerosis, which causes problems in every vessel in our body, but specifically um, the more smaller ones, which are usually found in our peripheries. And because it's causing that hardening and clogging, it reduces the blood flow to the actual organs. So you usually get pain in the leg muscles, um, and this could also lead to uh, multi-systems organ failure. Um, or, or uh, multiple organ um, disease or also known as MODs or whatnot. But um, it's because the, uh, the actual narrowing, how those art arteries keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller going down to those arterioles and then focusing all the way down to the capillaries. Uh, it's just that buildup um, kind of prevents, again, that um, vessel from actually expanding and contracting uh, because of that buildup and um, we are causing our, our cells to become hypoxic because we're not able to perfuse and do the adequate gas exchange um, all the way down to our big toe. Okay, so when we're talking about aneurysms, you can have an aneurysm basically anywhere there's an artery, guys. Okay, um, we're going to talk about specific aneurysms coming up, but basically... Um, an aneurysm is a localized abnormal dilation of a vessel, okay? Um, and yes, it is usually an artery. You could technically also have a vein aneurysm. They are rare, um, and I'm only going to focus on arterial aneurysms, okay? This can be caused by a congenital defect or possibly a weakness um, due to high blood pressure in the wall of the vessel, okay? So let's talk about the aorta for a second. Let's talk about high blood pressure. So we have this heart. Right, and it's pumping, 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 um, and it pumps a lot. It pu it pumps from the day we're born to the day we die. Right, it is constantly pumping. So when we have high blood pressure and we have that peripheral vascular disease or that peripheral dilation due to that that um, uh, atherosclerosis, our heart, when it's pumping that fluid, has to push that fluid harder. Right? It has to push that fluid harder because it's getting resistance from the actual vessels themselves. And because that heart is having to push harder, that squeeze of that heart, it's powerful, man. It is very powerful. And we're going into that aortic arch, right? And that arch, um, you know, and it, it curves pretty good. It's almost, a, it's almost a complete 180, right? And if we have this vaso, if we have this... Um, if we have this cardiac output coming out and my heart is having to push all that fluid out with resistance, it's going to keep pushing that actual um, uh, blood really hard against the inside lining of our aortas, right? And every single time it, 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 it pumps, it's punching the side of that wall and it's punching the side of that wall and it keeps punching the side of that wall and eventually that wall, right, that wall is going to get weak. It's going to start to become damaged and it could develop what's known as an aneurysm. The problem with the aneurysm is, is that now we have this little pocket, and as you guys can see here on this diagram, we have this little pocket. We still have normal blood flow going through the actual cylindrical part of the aorta. However, we have this little pocket where the blood actually sits there and pools, right? And as the blood pools, it kind of gets some of the currents and it kind of starts to spin and it kind of starts to spin but either way it's not being used in circulation and every now and then as that blood pools what happens when blood starts to pool right it starts to coagulate and it starts to um, develop clots and these it can continue to swirl and swirl and swirl right around this little circle area and every now and then some of those clots break off right and those clots are usually going to land down the smaller vessels. They're going to get bigger. They're going to break off. And it could cause a heart attack, a PE, or a stroke. All right. 
Um, the other thing is, is that if we have this dilation occur on the side there, um, we can keep filling that up with blood and keep filling it up with blood and keep filling it up with blood and keep filling it up with blood and keep filling up with blood and that thing's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually it's going to pop. And when it pops um, or it could start to leak, we can have serious problems really quick leading up to death for our patient. So where we usually find aneurysms is along the aorta, either in our thoracic cavity or abdominal region. If it's in our thoracic cavity, it's known as a thor uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. And if it's in, known in our abdominal, it's known as an abdominal aortic aneurysm, also known as a AAA. Okay. Um, this is the leading cause to all of these is uncontrolled high blood pressure. Okay uncontrolled high blood pressure all right um it can be very distinct uh, very difficult to distinguish from the cardiac chest pain in a pre-hospital setting all right the patients uh the big test that we do is the patient might have unequal blood pressures um, in the upper extremities so on the left arm right it could be low and on the right arm it's very high okay and i'm talking about like pretty significant unequal blood pressures okay we're not talking like a couple of points here okay we're talking like let's say like on my patient's left arm i get a blood pressure reading of 100 over 70 and on my patient's right arm i get this reading of like 180 over 120 or something like that okay um, you can also feel it uh, depending where it is in the body if it's in the thoracic you might feel um, unequal radio pulses that's why I train you guys to feel both radio pulses at the same time on your pa on your patients. Your left might be very weak, but your right is sitting there and it's bounding. Like you can, you don't even have to like feel for the radio pulse. You can see the bulb pumping right where the radio pulse. Where, where you guys would be taking the radio pulse in the first place. Okay, um, or we might have the exact same um, down the legs. Okay, if it's like in the abdomen. All right. If it's down the abdomen, it could be blocking off the actual flow to the left and right femoral arteries. So you guys might be feeling those femoral pressures or those those pulses behind the popliteal, or possibly even on top of the the foot for a pedal pulse, right? And again, that left might not be there, but that right is really strong and bounding, or vice versa, whatever it is. The other thing that you guys can look for specifically with abdominal. Um, aortic aneurysms is temperature variances in the legs right your left leg might be uh, way cooler um, than the right the the left is very cool the right might be warm to the touch right that could be something with uh, to deal with an aortic aneurysm um, and the problem is is that uh, if these rupture um, these can rupture on the surgical table guys they can already have you cut open um, they could have an, a rupture of the artery and even then they can't help you. Okay. Uh, we pop an artery, we pop a, a artery due to an aneurysm. It is a significant hole guys. And more than likely, um, our patient's going to exsanguinate themselves and die. So some common things that we're going to see with a thoracic aortic aneurysm, they're going to talk about a ripping, tearing quality in between their shoulder blades. I mean, that sounds present, doesn't it? Uh, a ripping, tearing quality in between your shoulder blades. Um, if it starts to leak, here's the best part. If it starts to leak, they're gonna complain of a wet, ripping, tearing quality. It feels like there's something wet uh, behind their shoulder blades, okay? Um, this is a great uh, CT scan of a thoracic aneurysm and as you guys can see it is coming right off of the aortic arch right you can see that bubble there where that um, blood is just kind of sitting there uh, pooling just kind of sitting there uh, circling right um, this could also be uh, a sudden onset of chest or back pain and we're talking severe chest or back pain okay um, and then again we want to make sure that we are checking for pulses bilaterally um, every single time we come up to patients, whether it be on the radial, the brachial, the carotids, maybe not the carotid at the same time because checking them bilaterally can make somebody pass out, but we have to check, 
right? So maybe check one side first and then the other and see if it matches or just don't squeeze so hard or whatnot, okay? Um, it can explain any kind of um, um, hypotension, low blood pressure. Maybe this patient says that, hey, you know, I haven't been feeling right. I got this kind of serious back pain right now. And you take their blood pressure and it's low and they say, hey, you know, I've been diagnosed with hypertension. So they normally have high blood pressure, but now when you guys show up, they're complaining of these plus have a low blood pressure. And they, it can also be because of some kind of unexplained syncopal episode. Remember, syncopal episodes is just fainting. Somebody has lost consciousness for a brief period and then came back to. When we're talking about the abdominal aortic aneurysm, also known as the tri uh, AAA, uh, the abdominal and or uh, they can have abdominal and or lower back pain and they will also talk about a ripping or tearing quality but this will be down in their abdomen okay um, they can, you can see uh, you can see a pulsating mass uh, especially in some of our geriatric patients and especially if they're skinnier they can actually lay flat and you'll actually see the bulge of the aneurysm in their abdominal cavity and you can look at it and if it's really bad you can see it pulsating okay so here's the deal when we're talking about this and I know you guys are starting to get into your secondary head-to-toe exam and we teach you guys to kind of inspect all four quadrants of the abdomen well if we're suspecting a triple A don't press too hard okay because you can rupture that by just pressing on the abdomen all right, so when we're doing a secondary head-to-toe assessment, we are just gently pushing down on the abdomen, okay? Just gently in all four quadrants, right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower, okay? We're not sitting there like kneading dough, right? Okay, we're not sitting there uh, making some sourdough or anything like that, right? A, a, a big old sourdough bread loaf. All we're doing is gently kind of feeling the abdomen to see if we can see any grimace on the patient's face or if we can feel anything abnormal. If you guys do feel this, stop palpating. Okay, stop palpating. All right. And again, you guys can feel for uh, diminished pulses in the extremities. It could also be an unexplained hypotension or some kind of unexplained syncope as well. And again, I want just to throw this in there specifically for triple A's. Um, you could have temperature variances in the lower extremities. That left leg might be cooler than the right. That right leg might be cooler than the left, vice versa, whatever. But you could have those uh, temperature variances in the legs. Okay, guys, I skipped a slide. Um, you guys can look over uh, the AMI versus dissecting an uh, aortic aneurysm. It's actually a table in your book, table 14-1. Make sure you guys look over that, okay? Uh, when we're talking about uh, cerebral aneurysms, uh, this is um, an aneurysm in the brain. And um, it's usually uh, kind of stroke-like symptoms, and I know we haven't got there yet, but we'll get there. Um, in our next lecture, but it's usually stroke-like symptoms and they complain of the quote-unquote worst headache of their life, okay? Um, these are the people that are sitting there at breakfast and they're eating their Cheerios and this thing pops and all of a sudden they're snot deep in their Cheerios bowl and they're not coming back, okay? However, um, they, the, the brain, the circulation of the actual brain itself, and again, we'll talk about this a lot more, specifically cerebral aneurysms when we get into our neurological uh, emergencies, but uh, the actual circulation of the brain, there's actually um, a, like a collateral circulation known as the circle of Willis. Um, and it's actually, the circle of Willis is actually there to help us if there is actual cerebral aneurysm, um, we can still perfuse the brain because the actual circle of Willis will help us um, kind of keep perfusing uh, certain parts of the brain for us. However, if that cerebral aneurysm is in the wrong place, um, it doesn't matter about the cerebral or about the circle of Willis. Um, this patient's just going to drop dead. Okay, so what are we to do? What are we to do in EMS if we're expect, uh, suspecting an aneurysm? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, um, these really don't change from uh, EMT basic up to paramedic, okay? Um, there's not much that we can do for this. This patient needs to get to definitive care. Uh, this patient more than likely is going to go to surgery. Um, we could do our best to get the patient a good, thorough history, including OPQRSTU, 
and definitely without a doubt a sample on these ones. We want gentle handling. Okay? We don't want to like be bumping these guys around. Okay? Um, we don't want to have to necessarily be driving code 3 hauling ass down uh, the freeway. And you guys know what the streets are like here in this town. Right? Um, and, and remember that you're riding in an ambulance. I know that you guys haven't really rode in an ambulance before. But let me try to describe what it's like driving in the back, the back of an ambulance. So basically an ambulance is like a Cadillac. Right? It's hot. It's sexy. Right? It looks good driving down the road, but think of a Cadillac with no shocks, no struts, and four flat tires, okay? That's what it's like being in the back of an ambulance, all right? And we don't want to disturb this patient any more than we have to. We don't want to get them hyped up. There's going to be a lot of therapeutic communications going on with these people, okay? Maybe we drive with the lights off in the back so that they can kick back and chill, right definitely put them in a position of comfort let's give them some oxygen okay let's give them some oxygen let's give them some oxygen via that non rebreather okay um, in order to try to help uh, perfuse um, as much as we can in the body and get good respirations in our lungs um, if it is a triple uh, a um, there is something called uh, the uh, mast trousers uh, or the PASGs that stands for um, Pneumatic anti-shock garment. It's also known as the uh, mass trousers. Mass trousers are still in your scope of practice. Um, they are definitely not used um, anymore in our systems. Um, they are still used by some of like the wilderness medicine people. Um, National Guard uh, is still using mass plants, so we have to teach you it because they're the ones using it. And it's also in your national scope state of, uh, national scope of practice. You guys can look up mast. M as in Mary, A-S-T, Mast Trousers. There's some great videos online. I don't think we put a video in your skills video for this because it is very uncommon to see these nowadays. So if you want to check them out, uh, go ahead and Google that. and You guys can check out how it's actually done. But basically, the Mast Trousers is basically a full-body tourniquet. Um, I can actually squeeze all the blood out of your extremities and start pushing it up towards your abdomen in order to keep all the blood um, into your core. It's a very interesting device um, that was used, uh, obviously developed by the military for people that had sustained severe life-threatening injuries. Um, and there are some, there were some uh, guidelines for it. The big guidelines were like um, the injury had to be below the level of the navel. Um, you couldn't have any other injuries above the navel and um, you had to inflate the legs before you actually inflate the abdomen and then obviously once you do that um, we had to there was a process of deflating this for for people and whatnot so we don't um we just we don't use them anymore i just want you guys to know that they're out there they're called mass pants or the pneumatic anti-shock garments okay uh, rapid transport. We want to try to drive as fast as we can, but we don't want to be bumping this patient around, right? Um, I have a, a, a story for you. Uh, I first became a medic, and we had a um, uh, transfer out of one of the local West Side hospitals here. Um, and we got there, and the nurse said that this patient was um, complaining of a ripping, tearing, te ripping, tearing, wet quality in between the thoracic shoulder blades they found that this uh aneurysm was actually leaking and this person's blood pressure was in the toilet um and i literally um it's it's probably uh it was i don't know five o'clock rush hour traffic it was going to take me 45 minutes to get across the river um and i literally picked up the the direct line telephone to phi and i talked to him i was like hey i'm here for a transfer going from west side to downtown um I can't take this patient. It's going to take me an hour to get there. You guys can get them there in, in, in five minutes. It's an up and down. You guys know how close that is by helicopter. And they actually took this patient by helicopter. Um, and again, that was just, you know, you being a patient advocate, right? Um, this thing is already leaking. They know it's already leaking. I don't know why they didn't call for a flight in the first place, but hey, um, I'm not a nurse. That's why they make the big bucks, right? So, um, and we don't want to give aspirin. Why don't we want to give aspirin? Why do we not want to give aspirin? Because aspirin is an antiplatelet, right? You guys use aspirin for 
heart attacks, right? And remember, it's that antiplatelet property. It's 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 it it doesn't take away the clot, but it makes the platelets slippery so they don't stick together, right? So we do not want to give aspirin in this case because if this does start to tear, we want the platelets to hopefully try to kick in and slow the bleeding down for us. If we give this patient aspirin, and it's very easy to do, this patient's going to be complaining of chest pain, right? We got to do a little bit more digging before we start going going to aspirin this patient's going to be complaining of some kind of chest pain all right but there's going to be something else there unequal um unequal um uh radio pulses um temperature variances in the legs um unequal pedal pulses or femoral pulses right um they might describe it as that ripping tearing quality okay um, there might not be any radiation of pain. We have to make sure that we're not giving these people aspirin because we are technically thinning their blood a little bit and we're taking away their clotting factors for their platelets because we're making their platelets slippery so that if they do start to actually tear and the blood starts coming out of the aorta, they will have no way of clotting because we took away their clotting factors by giving them aspirin. Be careful with that, guys. Okay? Be careful with that.